All right. So when I was a youth pastor, this was a, a couple years ago, um, I was getting ready for our Wednesday night youth group, and a lot of the students would come early to play games and hang out uh, before youth group started. And I had a, a boy who was a regular in our youth group. His dad was a, a trustee in the church, and uh, he was about, in, I think he was sixth grade, it's so around 12 years old, and he walks in, and he's obviously, normally, he's normally a very cheerful, cheerful kid, and he comes in, he's very distraught, and he just sits down at the table and just starts crying. And so one of my leaders points this out, like, hey, he's over there crying. We don't know what to do. So I go and sit down next to him, like, hey, right, Logan, what's wrong, buddy? My dad's going to die. And I'm like, well, this is news to me. I'm like, what's wrong? Is he sick? Thinking maybe he, like, I don't know, got diagnosed with cancer, and I didn't, this is the first time I'm hearing about it. No, he just turned 50. He's going to die soon. Because apparently when you're 12 years old, life ends after the age of 50. Which, by the way, his dad was very good health. You'd never guess he was even 50 years old. And so I'm, like, trying to console this 12-year-old boy who thinks that his dad is about to die any minute now. Uh, and so I think there's every one of us at some point have, are confronted by the idea of death whether you're a 12-year-old boy that thinks that life ends at 50, uh, maybe you have some kind of near-death experience, like you're in an accident, you see your life flash before your eyes, uh, maybe you get a diagnosis from the doctor that you were not expecting or did not like that would really make you consider your mortality. Uh, maybe you right, went through the loss of a loved one, and so not only are you you're, you're, you're mourning the loss of that person, but you're thinking, right, well, you realize I could be next at any moment now. Maybe you're, you're getting older in age, and you realize statistically I don't have much longer to live, right? So there's different stages in life when, we, when we're confronted with this idea. And I think what we believe about death will greatly determine the way that we live our lives. For example, some people are so scared of death that it paralyzes them and it keeps them from actually living. There's actually a name for this. It's called thanatophobia because apparently there is a name for every kind of fear. Did you know there's a word for people who are afraid of long words. I would tell it to you, but I have no idea how to pronounce it because it has 35 letters in it. Right, but that's, that's off topic. Right? The, again, the way that we view death will determine the way that we live our lives. And as right, people of faith tend to have a much better outlook on that, but even those of us that, that are Christians and believe in an afterlife, sometimes we have doubts and questions, um, and sometimes we have fears about that stuff, right? What is heaven really going to be like? Am I actually going to make it to heaven? What if, what if we just cease to exist, or things that, that go through people's minds? And again, what you believe about that will determine how you are going to live out your life. Uh, so as we continue on in the book of Philippians, we see the Apostle Paul who is basically giving his thoughts about death as he is now sitting in prison and contemplating his future. Uh, so last week we read uh, Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 through 18, and we see uh, the Apostle Paul, uh, he's, he's giving kind of an update to the church in Philippi on his circumstances. So uh, and he's, he's choosing to find joy despite the fact that from the outside everything looks like it's going terribly wrong. So he's locked up in prison. You think, oh no, his ministry is over. How is he supposed to continue preaching when he's in jail? Right? So he preaches to the guards and some of whom accept Jesus. And we know that right, those guards were not just ordinary prison guards, but these were very influential men in Roman society. And so the gospel's going on despite Paul being in prison. And then he talks about how there's, there's people out, right, that are in the church who should be on his side that are talking bad about Paul and, and trying to take advantage of his bad situation for their own selfish gain. And again, that sounds like it should be a terrible thing, but Paul says, right, either way, God is going to be glorified so that he rejoices. So we're going to reread verse 18, and then we'll, we'll work our way down through verse 26 by the end of this morning. So he says in verse 18, What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice. Whenever you see somebody re something repeated, 
pay attention because Paul really wants you to hear that part, that he is choosing to rejoice through these circumstances. And then verse 19, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. Now that word deliverance there is used all throughout the New Testament and it's commonly translated as the word saved. It's the same thing talking about our salvation, right? God forgiving us of our sins so that we, we can have a relationship with him. But in this case, I don't think it actually means his, his spiritual salvation. Right? We look at the, the context, right? There's two things that he know will help lead to this. One is the, the spirit of Jesus Christ. It's another way of saying the Holy Spirit, right? And that certainly could be talking about salvation because the spirit is very involved throughout the entire process of us accepting Jesus as our savior. But he also says, right, through your prayers, right, the prayers of the Philippians. Now, Paul understood better than just about anybody that, right, somebody else cannot pray and get you into heaven, right? We, we should be praying for other people's salvation, but that ultimately is a decision that has to come down between them and God, right? You cannot make someone else go to heaven. But also, Paul is not concerned about his salvation at this point, Right? Paul knows better than anybody. He has spent the last 30 years of his life defending the fact that true salvation and a relationship with God can only come through putting your faith in Jesus. Right? That's it. Nothing else can make you earn your salvation. Nothing else can get you into heaven. Right? So he's not talking about his salvation and getting into heaven. Right? Again, he's, he's writing this letter from prison. Right? He's under house arrest in Rome. He's talking about being delivered from jail, right? He's, he's going to get his freedom back, right? So he says, I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance, right? Me getting my freedom. We continue on in verse 20. As it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. And he says, for me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Now, the first thing that pops in my head is that, that phrase, right, to be or not to be, that is the question, right? And that comes from the Shakespeare play Hamlet, I believe. I don't know. I wasn't a very big Shakespeare person, if you could tell, uh, right? But in that, in that play, the protagonist is contemplating his own suicide, right? He's saying, is it, is it worth going on or should I just end it now, basically, is what that statement meant. That's not what Paul is getting at. He's not debating whether he wants to end his own life. But instead, Paul is simply accepting his circumstances, right? He understands that he's not in control of his life. Right? He also knows that right, Paul at this point would be probably in his late 50s, um, which doesn't sound very old to us, but back in that day in the first century, the average life expectancy was about 40. So he's, he's much older than most other people around, so he knows right, statistically he might be near the end of his life. But also he's in jail, and right, he, his fate is determined by the Roman courts and ultimately up to God. And so he's accepted that. It's pretty widely accepted um, by psychologists that there's, there's different stages to grief. And you can argue that Paul was maybe grieving the loss of his freedom. I think that would be perfectly understandable here. And right? so the different stages go through things like denial, to anger, to bargaining, depression, and then finally the last stage is acceptance. So we have no way of knowing whether Paul actually went through some of these stages or he's just much better than me and just he was so sure of the sovereignty of God that he just started on that last one. But Paul accepts the fact that his life is not in his own hands. Right? What happens to him, whether he is executed, whether he dies of old age in prison, or whether he gets set free is completely out of his control. But it's in God's control. And so that is what Paul is able to rejoice in. He's able to find peace and acceptance in the fact that he is not in control of his own life, but God is. And so whichever happens, whether he dies or whether he lives, he's okay with it. 
right? And he wants God to be glorified through either outcome. And then he goes on in the next two verses to kind of explain this a little bit better. Verse 22, if I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. Right? So he's, he's weighing the two outcomes, and he doesn't know which one he wants more. Now again, most, when we think about death, right, we're like, oh, I don't want to die. But Paul kind of welcomes it here. Right? And so he's saying, right, is it better to live or is it better to die? And so we look at right, the, the outcomes of either of those. Right? If he lives, right, he says, for me to live is Christ. Paul also wrote to the church in Galatia when he said, I no longer live, but Christ who lives in me. Right? And he says that if, if, for me to live means fruitful labor for me. Paul understood that he had a mission given to him by Jesus, and that was to bring the gospel to all of the Gentiles. And the longer he is alive, the more he gets to fulfill that mission. And that means that more people get to hear about Jesus, right? Because that's ultimately Paul's end goal. He wants to bring as many people to Jesus as he can. Right? And so Paul understands that if he's set free, he can continue on in his mission. And that's a really good thing because God gave him that mission. Right? But we also, there's, there's also plenty of other reasons to want to continue to live. Right? Life is really good. We get to be with our loved ones. Right? There, are, there are people in our lives that we can celebrate with and that we can enjoy their company. And that is a good God-given gift that we should enjoy and look forward to. Right? There's also just lots of other little things. Just think of, think of all the, the simple things that you enjoy in everyday life. Like being able to sit there and watch the sunset. Eating a delicious bowl of ice cream. That's one of my personal favorites. Being able to play with your kids or your grandkids. Right? Those are all really good things that make life worth living. But then, right, when we look at the other side, he also say, says to die is gain. Right? Normally we think of death as a loss. But for Christ, he says, to die is gain, right? And there's, there's lots of things to be gained through death for the Christian. For one, there's, there's no more suffering, right? Paul has, at this point, has lived a, a very long life. For the last 30 years of his life, he's been traveling around preaching Jesus, and it didn't always turn out very well for him. Right? He's had people chasing him, trying to kill him for as long as he can remember. He's been beaten. He was stoned, and the only reason that people stopped throwing stones at him is because they thought he was dead, only to survive that. He was shipwrecked. Right? He went through all of that. All of that pain and suffering is over. He will no longer be a prisoner. That will be over. Right? He also mentions having this thorn in his flesh, where he's, right, this thing that's agitating on a regular basis that God intentionally put in his life to keep him humble. That's completely gone. No more suffering. Right? Also, when he dies, you get to meet all of the other saints who went on before you. Right? You, can, you can go ask Noah, what was it really like living on a boat for a year with all those animals stuck on there? I think of my, my paternal grandmother died when I was 10 years old. Every memory I have of her was in a wheelchair. I've never seen my grandmother walk. I'm going to find my grandma and I'm going for a walk with her because she'll have both of her legs again, right? So we get to, right, all of our loved ones who have passed on, we'll get to see them again, right? There will also be rewards waiting in heaven. Paul wrote to the church in Corinth, and he says, for we must all appear before this, the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body. Right? Everything that you do to serve God, whether it's leading somebody to Christ, to raking stones out of the lawn, to serving in the kitchen, everything that we do, that we serve God and that we serve other people, we will receive rewards for when we get to heaven. And I don't think there's anybody who's going to have more rewards than the Apostle Paul. He is probably the most significant person in the history of Christianity next to Jesus, right after Jesus himself. Right? So if anybody has some rewards to look forward to, it's this guy because he did so much and he led so many people to Christ and he wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. Right? He did a lot. So he has some rewards waiting for him. Right? And also, right, all of the, the beauties 
of heaven. Because as great as sunsets and ice cream is, it's going to be nothing compared to what we will have when we get to heaven. Now here's the thing that most people don't realize. What we think of as heaven, right, where, where our loved ones are right now, is only temporary. That's not, when we get to heaven, that's not where we're going to stay forever. Right? The, the, both in the Old Testament and the Hebrew and the New Testament and the Greek, right, it was the, the word that's commonly used for the afterlife or for heaven is more of just this, it's, it's the idea of just a, a temporary holding place. Oftentimes in the Old Testament, they would refer to it as Abraham's bosom, or uh, they would refer to it as paradise. Even when Jesus used that phrase, when he was on the cross and the thief on the cross next to him, who believed in Jesus right before he died, and he says, I will see you in paradise. But someday, all of that is going to go away, right? And we don't know much about what this, the heaven that exists right now is like. The Bible gives us very, very few details about that. But it does say that someday, that's all going to pass away. Let me read for you in uh, Revelation 21. This is the, the ver- one of the verses that we read this morning um, during worship. But I just want to read the first couple verses for you. It says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, come down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man, and he will dwell with them, and they will be er, his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. Right? That's a picture of what heaven is going to be like. And he goes on to describe what this is going to look like over the next chapter and a half. Right? And he talks about this city that, that comes down from heaven. And this city is huge. It's about 1,400 miles wide, 1,400 miles long, and 1,400 miles tall. When Jesus says he's going to prepare a place for us, this is what he's talking about. And he says the walls of this city are made out of layers of valuable stones. And if you actually look at what those stones are, the walls are going to be sh- or the walls are going to be in the color of rainbows. Right? And there's gates all around this city that are made from, from pearls, and the streets are going to be paved with gold. And there's going to be a river of living water flowing through this city. Right? And he says that there's going to be no temple there because the temple is the place where you go to be with God and God will already be with us. Right? There's going to be no death, no pain. All of that is completely gone. That is what we have to look forward to. Right? And that is so much better than anything that we can have here. Right? That's, that's our hope. That is where we will spend all of eternity. And we get so caught up in the things that we have now and in our nice house and our nice cars and, and all of these things and none of that will matter compared to what we will have in eternity. I had a, a guy that I used to work with who was struggling with some things and so he just like reached out to me. I hadn't talked to this guy in years and he reached out to me and wanted to meet with me so he came into my office and we were talking about heaven and all that stuff and he's like, well my, my pastor told me that heaven is whatever I want most said, well, your pastor is wrong because heaven is not what you want most. Heaven is what you need most because heaven is where God is. And whatever you want most in this life will not be able to compare to the greatest thing about all this. Better than seeing our loved ones who have passed on, better than the beauties of heaven, heaven is where God is, right? When we get to heaven, we will get to see the face of Jesus, Right? And that's why Paul says, right, it is better to, to be with Jesus. Right? As much as I love every one of you, and I'm so glad you're here, and I love, I love being able to, to get to know with you and build relationships with you, I don't want you to take this the wrong way or get offended. But if it's between you and Jesus, I'm picking Jesus every single time. Right? Life is good. The afterlife is great. It is so much better than anything we will be able to comprehend. Right, so he can boldly say, right, it is better to be with Jesus. 
But he continues on in verse 24. He says, but to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and the joy and joy in the faith so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. Right? So he says, as much as I want to go to heaven, as much as I want to be with Jesus, he says, it is better that I continue on. And this is, right, he, he's talked about joy an awful lot already in the beginning of this book. But this is the first time he shifts from his joy to their joy, right? He wants to be a blessing to them by being able to minister to them, right? And Paul understood that as great as heaven is going to be, he was put on this earth for a reason. And the longer he is on earth, the more he will be able to fulfill that mission that God has given him, right? And so it's, it's just a little bit of delayed gratification, right? Because Paul understands very well that it's not an, a matter of staying on earth forever versus going to see Jesus. It's, do I go to see Jesus now or do I wait a little bit longer before I get to see Jesus and I get to bring a whole lot more people with me? And as much as he wants to be with Jesus right now, he knows that the longer he waits, the more people he can bring with him, right? And that's how Paul is able to say, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And we need to have this same attitude in our own lives. Again, some of you may be thinking that, that you're invincible and you're gonna live forever. And some of you may be thinking, well, I might not have much longer. Either way, we need to have this same attitude. I mean, there's, there's three things that need to happen in order to have this. The first thing is that we need to be confident in what happens to us when we die. Because all of those great things that I just read, right, are all of those, right, the, the, the glories of heaven and, and all of that that we have to look forward to does not apply to everybody, right? In fact, I don't, it doesn't apply to a lot of people, right? The Bible says that the gate is narrow, Right? And it's only for those who have put their faith in Jesus. Only those people who believe that Jesus died on the cross for their sins and then rose again from the grave. And the people that are trusting in that, it's not what we can do. I can't earn my way into heaven. Right? There's, it's, it's not based on my merits or my accomplishments or what I can do to get to heaven. It's only for people who believe in what Jesus did on the cross that he took all of the consequences of sin on himself so that way we wouldn't have to, right? So make sure that you are confident that you know what will happen to you when you die. If you are not, if you, are, if you don't know about all of this, right? If you're hearing this for the first time or you're questioning anything, please come talk to me, right? I, I'm gonna be having lunch afterwards and as much as I love to eat and I don't like to wait for my meals, I will gladly do it if it means talking to you about your eternal destination. Right? I will take that any time, right? Because that is the most important decision you can ever make in your life, is will you spend eternity with God or will you spend eternity separated from God in hell? Which is only, is only done, or the only difference is what you believe about Jesus. So please come talk to me if you're not sure about that. Right? So the second one, we, once we're, we're confident in what happens to us when we die, we need to realize that God is in control of our lives. And the Bible says that you're not promised tomorrow. You could live to be 110 years old. You could get hit by a car on the way home today. Which, by the way, if that happens to me, I'll know it was one of you because all I have to do is walk across the parking lot, so please don't hit me, right? Uh, and I want to live as long as I can, and I'm doing everything in my power to make sure that I live a long and healthy life. But ultimately, it's not up to me. It's up to God. And either way, God is going to be glorified. Because right? again, what's the worst that happens? You go be with Jesus forever, right? When, when you're confident in what happens, we don't need to fear death, right? But we need to realize that that's up to God. God is in control of everything. He is sovereign over all, like we just sung a few minutes ago, right? And so when we, we put our trust in that God is in control, then whatever happens, happens. It's okay, because God will work all things together for his good. And then finally, we need to realize that you have a mission to complete with your life, right? And I don't, I can't tell you exactly what that mission is, 
but I can tell you that it involves you bring, bringing glory to God and making him famous, not yourself, but all of the attention gets put on him. It involves you growing deeper in your relationship with him and your life being transformed by his spirit so you look more like him each day. It involves you getting involved with a local church and using your gifts to build up his body. And it involves you making more disciples, helping other people grow in their faith by, by sharing the gospel with them and encouraging them and teaching them what the Bible says and how to live out a godly life, right? Those are the th there, there might be some more specifics on top of that that God has specifically called you to do, but those are the things that he has called all Christians to do, to walk with him and to help others do the same, to grow disciples. And so if God takes you today— Great, you get to go be with him. If you're still breathing, it means that God still has a plan for your life. God is not done working in you and through you yet as long as you are still alive. Right? There's no retiring from the kingdom of God. It's not you reach a certain age and just say, okay, I'm done. I'm just going to sit back and wait for him to come now. No, right? God still has a purpose for you. You still have things that you can be doing for God's kingdom. And when God is done with you, you'll know because he'll take you. But that's not up to you. You don't get to determine when you're done working, right? You have a mission to do, right? To make disciples of all nations. And that mission only stops when you see Jesus face to face. Right? So in the meantime, we need to have the same attitude, right? To live is Christ, to die is gain. Whichever happens, that's up to God. He's going to be glorified through all of it. In the meantime, we want to bring as many people along so they can have that same relationship with God that we have. Now, we're, I'm gonna, we're gonna switch things up a little bit, and we're gonna, we're gonna go into communion, which is sometimes called the, the Lord's Supper. Um, so if you have your cups, make sure you pull those out. If you didn't get one, you can go back and, and grab one off the table there real quick. Um, but real quick, right, what, is, what exactly is communion, right? This is basically a reminder that Jesus commanded us to do on a regular basis, which is a way for us to tell the gospel to ourselves. As we share the good news with ourselves on a regular basis, because I don't know if you realize this, but the gospel is not just a one-time thing. The gospel is the thing that sustains us through our every day life. The gospel is the thing that helps us to be able to have this attitude, right? For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. So this is basically an object lesson that Jesus left for us um, as we walk with him, right? And so it's a symbol of the sacrifice that Jesus made, where this little, the bread, this little cracker represents his, his body that was broken for us and his blood that was shed for us. Right? And so every time we take part in this, we are reminding of ourselves of the good news that Jesus took the sacrifice, he was the ultimate sacrifice once and for all, where he took our sins upon himself. Right? So this is just a symbol, right? There's, there's nothing magical about this. This is, this is just juice and a little wafer, right? It's nothing magic happens when we take it, right? It doesn't save us. Right? Nothing. Right? Jesus, it doesn't make God love us anymore. He already proved how much he loved us when he sent Jesus to die on the cross. This is simply a remembrance of what Jesus did for us. Secondly, this is something that is only for believers. If you are not a follower of Jesus, if you're not sure, I would ask that you just simply don't take part in this. Right? Just leave it on the seat next to you. Nobody's going to care. Nobody's going to be paying attention. Um, also, this is for those who are walking correctly with Jesus. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, 27 through 33, or 32, he says, Whoever therefore eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the, the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. This is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judge ourselves truly, we will not be judged. And when, when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So I want to give you all a moment just to 
again, to, to judge ourselves, right? Just search yourself. Is there anything in your life that you need to confess? And if you can, do that right now. So I just want to give you a minute to pray. Now, if I can have Mickey, please stand and, and pray for the bread. So Paul also said in verses 23 and 24 of that same chapter, he says, For I have received from the Lord what I also deliver to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So if you haven't figured out, you peel off just the, the, the top clear layer. All right. So do this in remembrance of me, he says. If I can have Tim Storms, please pray for the cup. Paul went on to say, in the same way, we, or he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the, and the new covenant is my, in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. pray one more time. Father, we just, we thank you that we get to celebrate the death of your son. And it seems so weird to say celebrate his death with how, how brutal it was and everything that he had to go through. But it's only because of that sacrifice that he made that we can have a relationship with you. That we have a future hope that this life is not all that there is. But we have something far greater to look forward to for all of eternity. And I just pray that we will continue to proclaim his death to everyone around us on a regular basis as long as you have us still on this earth because that is why we are here. That is why you don't just take us right away because you have a mission for us that we can grow deeper in our faith with you and we can help others to do the same. And so just let this be another reminder of why we meet together, of why we are followers of you is because of the death of Jesus that all of this is possible. And we thank you for all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right. Thank you. <laughs>